Welcome to the IoT Unicorn Podcast. This is Pete Bernard from Microsoft. We have a very special guest today. We're going to be talking about long-term technology trends in the IoT space. So let's get started. This is actually our first episode, which I recorded with Andrew Hardy, who's the Senior Vice President of Sales and Marketing NXP. Uh, about a month ago or so, we've been recording a few episodes here before we got started. I want to take just a minute to talk a little bit about um, this podcast and what we're trying to do here, what is going on. And uh, turns out that uh, there's a lot of great conversations out there about IoT, a lot of things uh, going on there with the technology and impact of businesses. And I've been having a lot of great conversations with partners, internal uh, folks at Microsoft about the future of IoT, where it's heading long term. What are some of the things that we'll see changed around the business, around the technology, around impact to people? So I thought uh, it would be helpful, entertaining, and fun to take some of those conversations and record them and turn them into a podcast. And that's basically what we have here. So the IoT Unicorn name actually came from um, an idea around this uh, kind of like, you know, imagine this uh, deployment of IoT devices that are securely connected zero latency, super high bandwidth, super low cost, you know, intelligent on the edge, just kind of like this ultimate thing. And I kind of think of that as uh, the the North Star for IoT, like how do we get to that level um, of technology? And I don't know if if we'll ever get there, but we're trying to get there. And so I use the term IoT Unicorn to really kind of represent that, um, that North Star that we're trying to get to. And my conversations with the folks that you'll be hearing moving forward will be around that uh, journey. Um, In addition, I I know that uh, this is about the technology, but it's also about the people. And sometimes the people journey is as important, if not more important than the technology journey. So I will spend some time talking to guests about their journey, their career journey, how do they get to the roles that they're at, and uh, what impact that's had uh, with them. So. First one up is Andrew Hardy. Andrew is uh, someone I've worked with for a long time and uh, really appreciate his insight. We'll talk a little bit about um, ultra wideband and where that's heading. We'll talk about scale of IoT. We'll talk a little bit about how he got to San Jose and some of the interesting coincidences that uh, that has with me. So uh, sit back, relax, and uh, enjoy the pod. Thanks, Pete. We look forward to uh, a good, robust discussion today. Yes, it's good. Yes. And so full disclosure, Andrew and I have been working together for about a year or so, so we kind of know each other. So uh, hopefully this will be a good casual discussion. You know, the um, one of the things kind of, Andrew, I wanted to start out with, and as I said, we've been working together for a little bit. Um, and you're, you're down in San Jose in California. I'm up here in Redmond. One of the things that uh, was kind of interesting is like maybe you can just kind of tell us a little bit about how did you end up in San Jose? How did you end up at NXP doing doing what you're doing? Yeah, no, I think it's it's a great question. It's uh, it sort of spells out the relevance of the conversation we're about to have. I've been in the been in the semiconductor industry for for north of 20 years now. Uh, spent majority of my time in San Jose, and have been involved in many different uh, trends in the industry. Starting off with the dot com era and uh, and the networking spike that laid the infrastructure for a lot of the technologies that we leverage in our world today, and then moved into a lot of focus on the mobile side of our business and uh, had been in that for a good four or five years. And then ultimately uh, uh, joined NXP um, about five and a half years ago, uh, leading the Americas based in San Jose, where we've been for the last, uh, well, north of actually, the last five years have been focused on developing the internet of things and edge computing. And um, the reason I brought up those prior trends was because in a lot of ways, they have uh, they took shape very much like the IoT market is right now in that they started off with a lot of, uh, a lot of hype and a lot of uh, buzz. And then ultimately, as, as companies got into the details behind the concepts and the visions of, the, of that particular technology, really a lot of the hard work started after that. And eventually the vision came to fruition, uh, albeit at a slightly uh, different timing than originally had anticipated. But uh, I think to mm-hmm. a large extent have had a, a very big impact on our 
on our worlds that we live in today. So looking yeah. forward to talking to you today about the uh, the IoT journey and where yeah. we are, at least in XP sees it today. By the way, what, so what did you do during the dot-com era? I'm just curious. I was focused on the on the DSL market um, oh. and uh, the central office DSLAM market. So oh. I'm not yeah. sure I know what that is, but it yeah, sounds interesting. The, the, <laughs> the DSLAM market. Yeah, there you go. Cool. Yeah, actually, so interesting, another interesting factoid, speaking of journeys, I actually, uh, I had visited NXP several times over the past year in San Jose, and sort of, I think on my third visit, I realized that the, I had actually worked in that building when I was in the Bay Area. Uh, I was working for Phoenix Technologies, which is an old BIOS company, firmware company, and um, I kept, every time I visited that building, I'm like, this place looks really familiar, and, yeah. and then finally, I'm like, oh, yeah, I worked here for like, five years or something so i could never figure out where my office was but <laughs> but uh, it's an interesting building and in fact when i was down at phoenix down there speaking of iot journeys we started at an embedded software group at phoenix just specifically to do firmware for embedded systems and industrial mm -hmm. pcs and things so it's been a long journey i think folks that have been in the embedded we used to call it embedded now we call it iot but in the embedded world you know uh, the, a lot of things still are the same, you know, I mean, you've got firmware, you got to do bring up, you've got to figure out how to, you know, how to get your data in and out and, uh, you know, have, have all your low power stuff. But, um, obviously now we're in a sort of a totally different era. So, so, and I, and I think what's interesting, what I've known about NXP and, and kind of studied you guys over the past year or so, you have a really broad portfolio of, silicon and solutions. So, I mean, you guys are in everything, I think. I think it's like from MCUs to IMX chips to layer scape, cars, bathroom scales, you name it. So, I mean, um, where do you see sort of over the next three to five years, like what's the big, what's the big inflection point for businesses, for, for businesses that are driving these kind of IoT solutions and like a, and a, adopting this kind of stuff? Yeah, no, it's the, it's a, it's the uh, million dollar question, right? And mm -hmm. Um, billion, maybe. Yeah, exactly. More <laughs> a billion. Um, if we look at the, you know, going back to the sort of hype cycle, I, I think we have moved past the the hype, so to speak. Uh, a lot of the companies that we talk to in, in the various different markets, and that includes retail, uh, appliances for the home, home security, uh, industrial, automotive, they all they all absolutely see the value proposition and and there are now proof points and examples where certain companies have have come out and started to take advantage of the data that they're capturing on the edge mm -hmm. and making the user experience significantly better than what it was before the technology was there right. um, and, and you know even if you look at ces this year uh, a lot of the conversation moved from the vision into more of an implementation state. And so to me, it's a it's now a, a testimony to the fact that uh, people are deep into the details now. Uh, a, a mm -hmm. lot of customers are going through all the various components of what are required to build in a fleet of IoT devices. Uh, but what we've, re what we've sort of uncovered in this is that the complexity that is there with, uh, with building an IoT device in terms of the development of the, the family of products is substantially greater than what a lot of these customers um, had anticipated. Mm -hmm. Couple that with the fact now that you've got uh, additional challenges of, secu of security that mm -hmm. you have to manage to preserve your brand, um, especially as you enter into a home or an industrial uh, manufacturing plant or in retail and you're dealing with people's data. Um, that has become at the center, uh, the center of the discussion. And then in addition to that, people want to take advantage of machine learning and the, the vision and the, the potential that that technology has. Right. And so you've added on two additional layers on top of what is the traditional, as you mentioned earlier, software, uh, embedded software, power management, the price to performance ratios and so forth. You've got uh, these additional layers of complexity that you have to manage. And so what yeah. we're finding is customers' development schedules are expanding because of this complexity. Mm -hmm. And and so there, you know, you start off with a business case that you're aiming for a market window and you're as you get into that development, you find you can't either scale at the pace you needed or your execution isn't landing at the mark that you had. And so mm. that's creating a problem. Um, now, 
as you and I have talked about for now a year or, or beyond, uh, that problem, I think, in a lot of ways presents an opportunity for, you know, NXP and Microsoft to really go off and try to help solve this issue uh, to make that uh, that experience much more simple so that our customer our mutual customers can invest the resources that they have on the things that will differentiate them. First, having yeah. to create a new a new infrastructure. Yeah, the bar is definitely higher. I mean, back when I was at Phoenix, you know, I mean, the goal was to boot. You know, can, yes. can you power the system up and boot? Yeah. And then you're pretty much like 90% done at that point. But that's like uh, the starting point these days. And I actually, I was just uh, on a conference call before I came in here to do this recording, and we were talking to a partner, and they had this spec of all the stuff they wanted to do and. AI, vision, all this other stuff. And I was kind of like, are you sure you want to do all this, you know, right. like in, in the next right. six months? Because this is like, this is like a dozen PhDs worth of work, <laughs> you know, to do it. And it's like, um, I think it's pretty interesting. Like you said, like we, we find customers and we have a lot of common customers that are imagining these really awesome business outcomes, right? And, yep. but then, then the, and they, you know, they read all the articles, listen to all the podcasts like this one and they, get all excited about stuff and then but then they realize that the amount of work still to sort of get there from you know the platform is booting to actually um, solving business outcomes is pretty complicated mm -hmm. um and you know frankly all that time that's spent in that complexity is just eating away at their investment on the roi right so Absolutely. that that's that's the opportunity and then eventually once the once the product is built um, you then, you know, the real pressure testing comes is when it gets in front of the customer, their customer. Mm -hmm. Their customer expects that they will be there and stand behind their product for the next 10 plus years in some markets. Yeah. And so who who's going to be the guy that has the track record to stand behind and life cycle manage these devices that sit in your home or your manufacturing plant with the updated security and and the uh, the supply for that extended period of time and so it's a uh you know the complexity doesn't stop once the design's done the complexity is how do you build something that's going to sustain the test of time for these extended periods of time um, and then how do you uh how do you build the next generation of that product such that you're not having to reinvent the software the next generation right yeah no that's the ideal that's the ideal i mean i think and also it depends on the market right i think you you know you guys sell into a lot of markets the consumer market the commercial market i know for myself like i you know i get these ai cameras these connected cameras for my house and stuff and i had one of them that stopped working recently it's kind of almost disposable it's like uh, it's 30 40 bucks yeah it just kind of died so i'm like uh eh, chuck in the garbage but uh obviously if you're like chevron you know and you're outfitting all your oil rigs with all this you know tech that yep. stuff needs to be serviceable, you know, and and it's got the decades worth of of stuff going on. You mentioned security, actually, and I know that NXP has this huge position in the market in security. A lot of people maybe don't know that. Can you elaborate a little bit on all the stuff you're you're doing around security and and secure elements and like transit cards and stuff? I mean, your your the footprint of NXP is massive. Yeah. Right? No, it's, it, so we've. Uh, NXP for over over 15 years now has been investing heavily in, in security. We, we've spent the majority of our time focused on the financial uh, transactions uh, business for whether or not it's your credit card um, for the chip on the credit card to mm -hmm. authenticate um, that eventually moved into the mobile phone. Uh, and then we took that business and developed the uh, uh, mobile transit uh, uh, business as well. So if you go through a metro yep. uh, across the world, more than likely you're gonna you're gonna be utilizing NXP's technology for for getting access to the metro. And so after after we have established that market and given our focus on IoT, you know we've taken this wealth of uh, of knowledge and security and started to apply it to the IoT market. Now right. um, the challenge the challenge is is you're dealing with a connected device on the edge. Uh, obviously, that device is 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 talking to the cloud, and so when we when we went to to look at how we solve the security problem, became very apparent to us that we had to have a very tight relationship with a cloud provider that put as much weight on security as we did, um, and and so you know, no 
you know, uh, no pun intended, but this is exactly why we went to Microsoft, right? Um, because we felt that uh, there was a clear heritage uh, and importance in the design cycle that we saw um, that Microsoft put on their own uh, products related sure. to security. And I think that that just general philosophy of the importance of security married well with the uh, NXP. And so um, as we try to solve these security problems, which are different, um, in IoT than what we've dealt with in the past, we feel like we have a good partner with uh, with Microsoft that has really you know put that at the core of the 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 initiative that we're trying to solve with IoT. Yeah, yeah, and I know that we um, announced that Azure Sphere partnership with you this past year, which is pretty exciting, and um, you know marries well with kind of your heritage of security, and we have our security coming at it. You know, traditionally, obviously, Microsoft coming at it more from the PC angle and the mm -hmm. And the cloud angle, but you know, getting that aligned with you is going to be pretty awesome. I think that uh, we're kind of scratching the surface on security. What, yeah. One of the things we also find is that, I mean, you sort of see this as an example. In um, there was that recent um, thing with the Ring camera, you know, where people yeah. were spying on stuff. You know, they didn't default. They didn't turn on the two-factor auth. That wasn't the the default security. You, you had to sort of opt into that. And I think one of the things that we're finding is. Uh, even though there's a lot of security capabilities built into platforms and systems, a lot of times people don't utilize them. They don't turn them on. Um, and so we are we need to figure out a way, I think, to get people to sort of have much more of a default stance around secure endpoints than, than maybe they traditionally have had. But uh, that's asking. probably... A there's probably a whole other podcast we can do on security yeah. at least. But, yeah, cool. yeah, I mean, last point on that. You're <laughs> absolutely right, but user experience has to be uh, seamless as well. And I think that you bring up a really good point in that if you put a lot of the the uh, responsibility on the user, they may not always actually take advantage of it. Sure. And so sure. building a, a solution that and, and a service, frankly, and, and that's why we put a lot we, we think Azure Sphere is a is a great um, bar to set for security is there's there's a lot of seamlessness service that goes behind that that customers no longer have to to really worry about um, implementing a high level of security for their devices in the edge and so we're uh, we feel like that's a that's a really good bar that's been set and and obviously intend on trying to raise it over time yeah I think I mean that maybe that's one of the things that distinguishes kind of the the, the newer era of IoT from sort of what we've traditionally been doing is now we need to think about systems, you know, end-to-end -end systems as opposed to pieces of technology. Yeah. Um, sometimes they're, you know, call them solutions, but really end-to-end -end systems where it's the silicon, it's the firmware, it's the cloud, it's the service, uh, it's even the policies, you know, for some of these things that, that need to be in place for the whole thing to really work well. Um, and so it's, uh, I think someone once said, you know, IoT is a team sport and, um, Certainly, we need uh, lots of folks on the team to make it work. Is there anything else like we should be thinking about, like when you look out, let's say three to five years from now? We talked about kind of the old school uh, embedded systems. We're talking about IoT stuff here uh, and where things are heading. But what's what's kind of the what's the next frontier from NXP's perspective? Yeah, I think you're going to start to see a lot of uh, the, the machine learning capabilities that um, oftentimes we probably experience in the cloud today, um, you're going to see that starting to move down to the edge into smaller devices. And more and more, these devices are going to be able to learn um, behaviors and start to become more intelligent with time. Um, and so it, and by moving that machine learning capability, which is trained in the cloud down to the edge in a cost effective way, is uh, is going to improve the both the real time nature of decision making. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also going to uh, reduce the cost of uh, a lot of data going back and forth to the cloud. Um, so it'll be done in a in a more economic fashion. Um, and so ultimately, you know, the decision making of those devices is going to uh, to improve. You know, ultimately, also, I think you know, from a connectivity perspective, uh, more and more devices uh, on the edge is creating bottlenecks on the edge, and so you're going to see new emerging uh, wireless connectivity devices that will improve efficiency um, in the Wi-Fi networks. Um, obviously, 5G presents a, a significant uh, opportunity for more uh, more intelligence in remote areas. 
uh, and then divide, uh, new technologies like ultra wideband that will ultimately provide more precision accuracy of of actually identifying the location of devices and people, uh, literally down to 10 centimeter uh, spatial accuracy. So it's a uh, um, th that's extremely exciting. Mm. To think about um, you know identifying in a somewhat in a in a way that maintains privacy, but right. also allows you to. Uh, you know, to sort of walk seamlessly through your home or through your your uh, your workplace and gain access to devices without having to, you know, to to connect to a certain uh, um, network or log in and so forth. That can be done through a typical just a, an authentication of your device within a certain proximity and knowing it's you. So, so I, I, yeah, I was going to ask you, like, so ultra wideband. I mean, is that something that can be used to track? location location of things yes or people absolutely. yeah and the first the first area that this is going to start off is uh really in the in the automotive mm -hmm. uh, sector for key access and um that particular technology will is is going to offer a more secure way of authenticating that you have the keys and where you are located so um over a, a pretty long range so you can uh, you can authenticate and pass keys along across mobile devices and so forth. So this will uh, help me find my keys, or is this? A yeah, well, actually, it'll just <laughs> maybe, it'll, maybe it'll potentially allow you to eliminate your keys, oh, uh, so you can use better. your phone for that. Okay. Uh, and then ultimately, though, then you can start to see that playing into uh, access into the home, and right. uh, you know, uh, or into an enterprise location, or detecting in an emergency where people are in an enterprise and uh, in, in a very close proximity, right? So yeah. there's a lot of potential, uh, even in retail as well, as people walk through the aisles of the uh, the supermarket and yeah. they're, where they're spending time and, and not spending right. time. Right, managing traffic. I think, I think one of the things we'll see is that there's a lot of interest in cameras right now, and people use the term cameras, and everyone kind of freaks out because no one wants their picture taken. And in fact, when I use Teams, uh, hashtag Teams, the uh, I use my camera all the time. Very few people actually turn their camera on. I think people just have a natural, I don't know. Bad hair day? Bad hair day, I guess. <laughs> um, but uh, I think one of the cool trends, and this is where UWB might, might help, is I think there's going to be a lot more sensors around understanding whether there's people there or not, or there's, you know, things are happening without actually having to identify faces. And yes. actually having to generate PII because the last thing you want is a bunch of faces up to the cloud yeah. and then bad things happen. So I think it's kind of interesting to think about alternative kind of sensor tech that will be coming out and UWB be part of that is like, you know, I want to know the traffic flow around my store, but there's no reason why I need cameras to like, you know, they look at that. people's faces. Um, and so making some of that stuff, you know, much more, uh, much more anonymous um is is i think a, a really good thing because i think i think people are rightly concerned about just too much you know private information getting up into into uh into the system as they say so yeah. so that's cool that uh that, that might help that uh, that area you know i i think the next area that we we have got a a lot of investment going into right now is in the automotive sector um yeah basically there is a you know, you can start to see that the automotive industry is starting to revolutionize with the electrification of, of automobiles, and there's the vision of uh, autonomous vehicles as well. Um, but uh, the entire architecture of an automobile is is really sort of being revolutionized right now, um, and it's almost, I mean, it really is, frankly, the ultimate edge computing platform because it's on yeah, wheels. Yeah, no, that's true. That's and, true and uh, connected to the cloud. And, and there's a lot of latency components that are uh, challenges that you have to deal with there. And so we're, you know, we see customers and we are as well, um, really looking at that problem very differently than we than the traditional automotive architectures. And it's almost a lot like a, a kind of a small data center on wheels and yeah. the networking and the storage and the decision making through processing and how that's distributed throughout the vehicle is uh, is an area that's uh, getting significant investment right now um, and it's uh, emerging new players as well too right and I know Microsoft is uh, is uh, in that conversation from the yep. cloud side 
Yep. Um, we are absolutely in the discussion from uh, from secure edge gateways in the in the automobile as well as the infotainment side. So mm. for us, it's uh, I think just naturally over the next five seven years, um, the the work is being done now to come up with very mm. new innovative vehicles that uh, we will start to see driving around us in our world, yeah. which is very yeah. exciting. Yeah, actually, so we had a um, we hadn't bought a new car in about ten years, and my wife recently picked up a Jeep Gladiator. It was pretty cool. It's like that Jeep yeah. with the the pickup cool. thing, yeah. and the the tech in this thing. I mean, the, the just the dashboard and the electronics was like amazing. Like, I mean, it felt like it was like a hundred years in the future relative to this old Ford Flex. Nothing against Ford and Flex. I'm sure the new ones are great, but the yeah. The 2009 one was not so great, but uh, <laughs> the Gladiator was like super impressive. And uh, so, right. yeah, I think there's a long way to go there. And, and the other thing that's interesting about the, the automobile, and you can almost apply this to other things, too, is that there's so much data being generated by these things yes. to, 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 to run, you know, algorithms on the, the, the telemetry. The amount of data on these things is incredible. And it's, you know, I think we're just scratching the surface about what we can understand about equipment based on data. I saw it uh, like at CES, someone had hooked up a, someone had hooked up some telemetry around the current draw on a coffee machine. Um, and they were able to, based on the different current draw, kind of determine which type of coffee you were making, like which pod was being inserted because yeah. different pods required different sort of amounts of power draw. So even taking something like that or like your dryer or washing machine, like the dryer, if the, if the current draw is very high in the dryer, maybe it's overloaded. And things like that. So you, I think we'll see people taking all these signals. Yes. And doing some. There's, really there's a lot of examples of that. I, I mean, ultimately, what's the you know one of the biggest decision criteria for an automobile is a maintenance record, right? And right. And, um, the uh, ability to quickly diagnose and improve that experience, because ultimately ma- there is going to be maintenance. But uh, to the ability to to go in to get your car serviced, know precisely where the issue is, when it occurred. And, and maybe even potentially have the, the components ordered for you prior to arrival, that just changes the complete user experience altogether, right? Oh, yeah. No, that'd that's be amazing. a passing proposition that... Yeah, I needed, it that, I needed that on my 2009 Flex because that, yeah, that doesn't shop yeah. a lot. <laughs> be hours in the day, right? So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Fantastic. Well, Andrew, thanks, uh, thanks for indulging us with your time. Oh, thank you for having me. This Down there great. in that beautiful building in San Jose. Yeah. And, yep. Uh, yeah, I, I'm sure we'll see each other pretty soon. Very good. Thanks again for the conversation and uh, and the partnership as well, Pete. Cool. Thanks, Andrew. All right. Take All care. Right. This is Pete Bernard. You've been listening to the IoT Unicorn. Thanks for joining us. Stay tuned for the next pod.